go ahead and get started. So our talk is I've upped my attitude, so up yours. We were trying to think of something catchy. So that was about all of our creative juices. So if the rest of it you guys fall asleep during, we're okay with that. Just kidding. So um, first things first, about us. Name is Nathan Smith, Twitter handle, at NateZone. Um, I'm a senior security analyst at InContact. Um, I'm married, and I, we just adopted our first baby boy about five months ago. And this is my very first B-Sides presentation. I'm Brian Hadfield. Um, my handle is StuPot. I'm a uh, security architect at InContact. Um, of course, the obligatory alphabet soup there. I have several kids. Um, my coworkers always joke that I have 100, but uh, I only have eight. Uh, this is also my first B-Sides presentation. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that this is uh, presenting a topic like this at a security conference is way outside my comfort zone. So I'd like to invite all of you to join us by stepping a little bit outside your comfort zone. We'll do a little bit of interactive uh, stuff here and um, should be some fun and maybe it'll be something useful for you. So last year at the Black Hat Security Conference in Las Vegas, they interviewed about 250 attendees um, to try to get an insider's view of the cybersecurity environment and, um, and what the current state is. You guys all get to participate in this survey too today. So one question, how likely do you think it is that your organization will have to respond to a major security breach in the next 12 months? Five nines, pretty likely. Let's see what the survey says. So about three quarters of, the, uh, of those surveyed said that they think it's likely they'll have to respond to a major data breach in the next 12 months. 15% said they have no doubt that a major breach will occur. At the bottom we have 6% um, that didn't know how to respond to the question. Those are the ones that are already breached. So how much of a problem would you say a breach would be for your organization if it occurred? The average cost of a data breach is about $4 million now. By almost every measure, the cybersecurity problem is getting worse and worse. It's worse this year than it was last year. Why does it feel like we're losing the battle? Um, part of the reason we chose this nice, colorful, cheesy uh, template was so that you guys didn't get depressed when we went through this, uh, this survey. Does your organization have enough security staff to defend itself? <laughs> no one. About three quarters, again, said they do not have enough security staff to defend their organizations against the current threats. 19% said they are completely underwater when it comes to staffing. Only one in four said they have enough staff to handle the threats. And I would say they probably don't understand the threats in that case. Do you have the resources you need to do your job? Budget. 63% said that their departments do not have enough budget. In fact, 20% said they are severely hampered by a lack of funding. I think that's probably low. I feel that way. Two-thirds said they do not have enough training and skills that they need to perform all the tasks for which they're responsible. 10% said they feel ill-prepared for the threats they face on a daily basis. So, to recap, why do security initiatives fail? Well, the biggest reason that security initiatives fail is the fact that there are not enough skilled professionals whether it's a shortage of staff or lack of training, the expectations placed on us are unrealistic. We also know that there's a lack of support from management in many cases. If your project is not a priority for management, it's going to be very tough to get it done. 
and we don't have the funding to get the tools and services that we need to be effective, among other reasons. So, um, our next question for you guys is, why have a positive attitude? What do you guys think? <laughs> Perfect, that's what we're looking for. Okay, so one thing that um, having a positive, positive attitude does is it actually makes you feel inspired, you know? When you have that positive attitude, you're going to feel like you can accomplish anything. You're not going to feel so downtrodden. So we were trying to start you off with, let's feel downtrodden first, and then let's try to pick you back up after that. The next thing it does is we're going to look for solutions instead of dwelling on those problems. If we do get a breach, or if we do have some sort of indicator of compromise, we don't need to focus on that problem. Rather, we should focus on, look, we found that indicator. And now that we found it, how can we actually defend against that? The next thing is that being positive is contagious. You're going to have coworkers around you. You know, within our organization, there's only four of us. So we rely heavily on our network teams, our systems teams, and things like that. So if we're positive about the outlook of things, they'll also be positive about that out outlook. Again, this is similar. It helps motivate them. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make them want to work with you when you have that positive attitude. They're going to want to be around you, and when they see a meeting invite from you or someone from your organization, if you guys are the, the bubbly type or you're positive and you're always thinking of um, thinking that way, they're going to want to be around you. The next one is a greater self-esteem. And the last one is going to be it keeps, your, keeps you happy, which in the end is going to be better for when you go home and you, you're away from work and you come to your spouse or your kids and when you're happy, that just, again, it's contagious. Cynicism and sarcasm are prevalent in the workplace these days, and both can really bring you down. You may not be able to control everything around you, but you can always control your attitude. Here are some ideas you can try. Be appreciative of everyone who does a good job and gets things done on time, especially if they go above and beyond. Saying thanks feels good for both the thankee and the thanker. For some reason, people tend to focus on everything they don't like and things that are going wrong. Instead, focus your attention on things that are going well. Reward yourself or praise another individual for a job well done. If you're part of a team that does something successfully, have a get-together to celebrate it or send quick notes to others to outline things that are going well. When you run into problems, don't just focus on them. Change your focus by asking yourself, how can I solve this issue, and what can I learn from it? Every problem is an opportunity to learn. So focus on the potential to improve. And force yourself to smile, even if you don't feel like it. A smile will actually shift how you feel internally. And when others see you smiling, they feel better as well, as long as it's not a creepy or evil smile. No one likes a complainer. Instead of talking about your problems, try proposing solutions. By focusing on possible solutions to challenges, you maintain a constructive atmosphere. Here's one of my favorite quotes. No misfortune is so bad that whining about it won't make it worse. Nobody wants to hear you whine. Okay, so when people think of InfoSec professionals, there are some stereotypical things that they think about us. So the first one is that sometimes they think we're angry. Um, you know, we were, I was just listening to a talk just barely where we have that knee-jerk reaction when anything happens. A lot of us are plagued with that to where it seems like 
were upset that we weren't ahead of the curve for that vulnerability. Next one is that we might be stubborn. We want it our way. We don't want to do it the way the network architect has designed it, or we don't want it the way the systems architect has designed it. We want it our way because we know better, right? We're security professionals. The next one is that we might be uptight. We're not willing to actually enjoy being around other people. We, we think that there's no joy in what we're doing. The next one is that we might be irritable. You know, we might, if someone says one thing to us, we might get annoyed with them. We might give them a look of, why would you even say that? So they're going to be a little bit more hesitant um, to come to you with an, an idea. The next thing is know-it-all. You know, as information security professionals, we are required to know quite a bit about everything. You know, so when we present things, there's going to be a different way to present them rather than coming to them as, hey, you didn't do it right. It's more of a, hey, we've learned of this. What do you think? The next one is apathetic, that we don't feel for them. Now, you know what? Your firewall is how many versions behind? I can't even believe you'd be that many versions behind. Whereas they may be, like in our organization, responsible for uptime. So it might be a little scarier to go to the latest and greatest version. So this picture kind of showed a good stereotype for me. You know, I don't need anger management. They need to stop hiring stupid people. So, how do we get others on board? How do we get them to work with us on our security initiatives? Try to find areas where your security initiatives overlap with the things that other teams are already doing. For example, if the network guys are replacing an old device because they have a new one with more features, maybe uh, you, could, you might be able to insert yourself into that project and get stronger ACLs or better firewall rules. Sometimes the pushback we get is simply a case of not clearly communicating our point of view or not making the effort to understand those we're trying to collaborate with. Try to gain an understanding of their roles and responsibilities so that you can communicate with them in their own language and respond to their needs. Engage them in conversations about their work. People like to talk about themselves. So listen with an open mind and they'll be more open to listening to what you have to say. If your company is subject to PCI or FedRAMP or HIPAA or some other kind of regulatory guidelines, it's much easier to convince the other teams to work with you. Just make sure that you can definitively show that what you're asking them to do is required by that framework. The first time you ask someone to do something for compliance and they find out that it's not actually a requirement, you lose credibility. Likewise, if something you're doing improves alignment with company policies, point that out as well. The company has already bought into these initiatives, so you should have management support on those things. Make sure that when you're asking for something, you make it a very clear assignment. Who needs to act? What do you want them to do? Why does it need to be done? When do you expect it to be complete and how will you verify it? Send meeting notes afterwards and reminders. Remember, when people feel involved in creating a solution, everyone takes ownership of it. Everyone is invested in committing the resources to see the project through to completion. And so I'd just like to add one of the biggest things by our boss on this, who, what, why, when, and how, he always comes to Brian and I and says, when did they say they would get this done? And if we say, well, they said they're gonna work on it soon, he says, you know, if you don't get this when, then it's just a wish. You know, they can do it sometime, in somewhere, whenever. Okay, so, you know, at times we may need to employ a little bit of social engineering. 
And when I talk about social engineering, it's not as much about the information security aspect. It's more of um, convincing someone to do something that they wouldn't ordinarily do. Um, so, just like in marriage or any sort of relationship, you need to pick your battles. Which thing is more important? Is that patch that's two years old more important than that zero day that, that just got dropped? Choose the battle which is more important to you. Which one's going to be the, the hotter iron in your fire? Which one's actually going to um, allow you to provide more coverage or protection for your organization? The next one that we really um, like to do is an offer of lunch. People always like to be fed. So if you're offering to take them to lunch and say, hey, if we could go to lunch and you could tell me how this new application you coded works, just so we can better understand it, they're going to be more apt to say, of course, there's no problem. I'd love to go tell you about my, um, my new app that I coded for the environment. But the other thing is it's a change of environment. Sometimes it's a little less threatening to be out at lunch, to be able to be eating and just talking and um, you don't feel like it's such a stuffy environment. The next one is going to be, you want to ask, like Brian said, those key questions. Some of the ways to phrase things with them is going to be, how would you do this? So for instance, hey, if you need to implement stronger passwords or you need to make sure ACLs, you'd go to them and say, how would you do this? Like if you could do it, how would you do it? Then it makes them feel like that project is just as much theirs as it is yours. The next one is you can come to them and say, what do you feel is best? You know, sometimes um, we get a little complex in our thinking and how much we need them to get done. Rather than doing that, we can come to them, ask them how they feel they could do it and see the steps that they would go through so that in the end, we're both hitting the goals that we want to hit. And then the next one is how can we help you be successful in X project, you know? They may be deploying load balancers, great, but how can we help you be successful in deploying those load balancers with the proper security protocols, with the proper list of ciphers in the, the, right, the way you want it done? And just as, you know, he says, those were the droids I was looking for. So, one of the things that we did that, um, that I felt was very successful was in order to get more visibility in the company and to promote understanding of security initiatives, we decided to participate in National Cybersecurity Awareness Month last October. This is an annual campaign by the Department of Homeland Security. The first thing we did was to announce the campaign in a company-wide newsletter. In that article, we introduced the campaign, described what to watch for throughout the month, and announced that there would be a drawing with prizes at the end. Everybody likes prizes. So each week, we sent an email to all employees detailing an aspect of cybersecurity in an entertaining way. Then we hung eye-catching posters throughout the building to reinforce the concepts. At the end of the month, we invited everyone to participate in a brief security quiz with the chance to win a Visa gift card in a drawing. This campaign went over very well. Some of the comments we received afterward, um, you can see that people were really excited about it. My favorite one, you knocked this one out of the park, Brian, way fun. I have been at In Contact for almost six years and this is the first time we have done anything like this. Well done. That made me feel good. But you can see that people who ordinarily wouldn't be very interested in security initiatives got on board because we were able to make it fun and engaging for them. Now keep in mind that this particular campaign didn't actually accomplish anything that we were trying to do. Um, we had a lot of security projects that, uh, that we needed help with. But what this did do was it got people thinking about security so that when we approached them and said, hey, remember that, uh, 
that one email you received about this particular thing. Can you help us implement that? And these people are a lot more excited and ready to help um, when, they, uh, when they feel involved, when they feel uh, excited, and when, uh, when you're able to catch their attention with things like this. So let's talk about, we're just going to summarize of things that work, things that we have seen work for us. So the first thing is positive self-talk. You need to be making sure that you're talking positive with yourself. Some people may not, you know, not talking to yourself. Some people think you're a little weird, but actually internalizing the positive message. The next one, like we said, is you need to look for the wins rather than the losses. There's a lot of projects, there's a lot of things that we could all be doing. But instead of focusing on the ones that fell through the cracks, the ones where they guaranteed a timeline and they weren't able to deliver, that we don't focus on that. Rather focus on, you know what, that was great that you went out and you set up a schedule to update all the firewalls and you did it. Or, you know what, that was great, you guys created a schedule to, tar to start patching. It wasn't all the patches but it was some of the key patches that we asked you to do. The next one is to assume positive intent. You know, when you're writing emails back and forth to others, tone and actually how they would say it to you doesn't always come across. Sometimes it may come across that that guy, um, he may seem a little more mean or a little more demeaning the way he comes across to you. But you just need to remember that that's probably not the way he intended it to come across either. So when you're responding back, to make sure that when you're responding that it comes across in a way that it's clear and concise for them. And one of the um, big ones is have face-to-face -face conversation. It's so much easier to talk to guys, go down to their desk and talk to them and explain to them and help them understand versus, like I said, email because you don't convey tone. They don't see face, facial or body expressions. And then the last one is just to be friendly in general. Whether or not you have to work with that team, if you smile or you're friendly to someone, they'll remember that. They may not remember your name, but they may say, hey, you know what, that guy smiles at me every day and that made my day better. So when you do come and have to interact with them, they'll remember that. So, Thanks for attending this um, decidedly non-technical presentation. Um, even though this didn't have uh, a lot of technical things that you can implement, I do believe that the person-to-person -person interactions that you have will help you to get your technical and security initiatives accomplished. So uh, as Captain Picard would say, make it so.